Hello, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Building Resilience in Early Childhood Education. My name is Christopher Ng. I am the co-chair of the Education Committee and an active member of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, a nonprofit, non-governmental organization created in 1977. Today, we have over 1,400 members representing nearly 300 companies, making it one of the largest Canadian business organizations outside of Canada and one of the most active international chambers in Hong Kong. Now, we deliver four services to our members, the first one being representation and advocacy engagement, the second one being business promotion, networking, and brand exposure, the third one being learning and training, and finally, uh, providing access to information and insight. Now, today, we are thrilled to be bringing you a conversation about the ways we can build resilience in our children in the classroom as they spend their most impressionable years in the midst of a pandemic. I am very pleased to have with me today three experts in the field representing different institutions, philosophies, and learning approaches. Um, so first off, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Betty Yao from Fairchild Canadian Academy Limited. Becky is the principal of Fairchild Kindergarten here in Hong Kong and has worked in early childhood education for over 15 years. Um, she is also one of the key opinion leaders in the Reggio Emilia study in Hong Kong and has undertaken multiple lecture roles from Hong Kong Baptist University and Yu Chung College of Early Childhood Education. And as a fun fact, she is also a volunteer leader and assistant trainer for the Hong Kong Girl Guide Associations. English speaking division. So welcome, Betty. Next, we have Ray Gern, who is the CEO and founder of Higher, Higher Ground Education and Guidepost Montessori. And Ray is coming to us live from Texas uh, in the US. Now, Ray, he received a BSc, his Bachelor of Science with Honors from the University of Toronto, as well as an Association Montessori International Teaching Diploma from the Montessori Institute of San Diego. Uh, he's had a 13-year career with Laporte Schools, where he took over as CEO in 2010, and over a short period of five years, was able to turn it into the largest Montessori, Montessori operator in the U.S. Um, in 2016, um, Ray founded Higher Ground Education with the vision of greatly accelerating the growth of Montessori education globally. Last but not least, we have Dr. Amelia Lee, who is the Associate Dean of Program Development and Head of Early Childhood and Elementary Education at the School of Continuing Education at Hong Kong Baptist University. Dr. Lee is a seasoned educator with substantial experience in early childhood education, teacher training, curriculum design, educational management, and research. Um, she is the President of the World Organization for Early Childhood Education, the ONEP of Hong Kong and she has chaired the Committee on Early Childhood Education under the EDB Education Bureau's Curriculum Development Council in designing the Kindergarten Education Curriculum Guide from 2017, and has been a core member of the EDB's Task Force on Homeschool Cooperation and Parent Education. So once again, a big welcome to all our guests. Now, each panelist will present for about 10 to 15 minutes, and we will then have a Q&A at the end so um, if you have any questions, please add them to the chat box. Now, without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Betty who will kick off the session. Betty, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, good evening to Ray. Um, I'm, thank you for the introduction and I'm delighted to share in this webinar today. Let me share my screen, uh, hopefully it works. There we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? I think I'm on the. Okay, let me go back. So my focus this morning is on how we build resilience through cultivating relationships, um, and, and sharing how we maintain these during the COVID pandemic, and also some critical skills that um, we need to build um, resilience in the early years. So as you've heard, now let me go back to the beginning. It wasn't very well organized. As you've heard, I'm the principal of Fairchild Kindergarten, and we are founded by um, our Canadian founder, Joseph Fong, and his family. And over the last seven years, we've established two campuses in Hong Kong. We have our Teen Hao uh, Playgroup, uh, Fairchild Junior Academy, for our youngest learners. And we have our kindergarten in Sai Ying Pun for children slightly older, two to age six. And our mission is to cultivate curiosity, creativity, and confidence in every child. 
And we do that through an inquiry-based approach to learning, of course, through play. And our other uh, aim is to bring the outdoors in as much as possible, living in an urban jungle such as Hong Kong. Um, that's very important to, uh, to all of us, as we've noticed during the, um, the pandemic. So we've chosen um, the emergent curriculum and we, um, as you've heard, we use the Reggie Amelia approach. Now, if you haven't heard of that before, don't worry, it's a uh, good early years practice. But the Reggie Amelia approach was established just after the end of the Second World War by a small group of parents who wanted a different kind of education for their children. So it was quite progressive at the time. Um, similar to uh, the Montessori approach, it's founded in, in Italy. Um, it's a philosophy that puts the child at the center, very similar to the Montessori approach. And what we do is we try to flip the idea of a modern classroom into child-led learning, where children use their own agency. We see children as very strong and capable citizens, and uh, we value them in their own right. We see teachers as a partner in the children's learning. We don't, as teachers, always have all the knowledge. We don't need to know everything because actually children can share their knowledge and build their learning processes and find out meaning uh, through their own investigations. Of course, we use the environment as the third teacher. So it's not just the, the, the relationships built through uh, the classroom, but um, the deeper connections throughout school spaces. We also use something that's called 100 languages. So basically allowing children to use lots of different ways to express themselves, not just through the academic side, but perhaps through drama, through the language of movement, through um, messy play. So there are lots of different ways children can uh, use to express themselves. Documentation, uh, like uh, Montessori, is a, a very important part to making the learning that's happening in school visible. And the other great part uh, that, that's been particularly um, noticeable is the, the importance of community collaboration. I want to share some theories with you just very quickly. And um, the one on the left is uh, Yuri Brofenbrenner's ecological systems theory. Uh, I'll do a little bit of a demo. We have a child here and the child has their family around the outskirts. And after the family, you then have the school Outside of the school, you have um, the community, and outside the community, everything else that impacts on the child. And if we think back to maybe 18 months ago, when COVID first hit, that child's world completely was um, disrupted. So when we think of what we do for the child, we have to think about um, the systems that affect them, consciously or unconsciously, everything that happens around that child will have some kind of impact. The other thing um, I want to touch on, and, and it's something you're already familiar with, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We talk about um, the different levels of need. So one part I'm going to focus on is the, the yellow uh, level, love and belonging. Um, we have to address, our children can't reach those higher level, uh, uh, having their needs met, building confidence, having self actualization without having the foundation built. So let me just obviously talk about how children really are figuring out um, how things are working in their world. So their early experiences really have a big impact on outcomes later on. So we want to focus on positive experiences that build, uh, build on their strengths, build on their confidence, and therefore build their resilience for life. And of course, ongoing negative experiences in the early years, we know through research, does lead to uh, negative outcomes later, and of course, intervention later on in life. So we really want to give children the best start in life. So how do we build resilience in our school? Now, um, I think Dr. Lee is going to talk about how resilience uh, is defined as bouncing back. And I think the whole world has been very dynamic at uh, doing that over the last uh, year or so. Um, my focus here is on cultivating those authentic relationships and connections. So building on that from Maslow, Maslow's triangle, you saw the middle level was belonging, love and belonging. How do we build belonging in our classrooms at school? Well, the first thing we do is we create uh, positive and very caring, um, respectful relationships between the children and the teachers. That's really providing that secure foundation for the children to therefore take their learning further. Our teachers uh, support that um, and our children connect very quickly when they come into a safe 
uh, learning environment that's very comfortable to play, it's a happy place, they're already ready to explore and learn about everything around them. And of course, children need to be allowed to be creative. Uh, to, um, you know, 21st century skills are also very important. And how do we encourage creativity is to allow them to be innovative, to give them the agency and the freedom to try new things and test new concepts all the time. So we're building belonging, not only for the children, but also for our teachers. Um, and the teachers are, of course, the the main, the main ones leading those positive connections. They're following children's uh, cues, they're responding to uh, questions that children have, and they're building up uh, reciprocal interactions. And we have a term for this, it's called serve and return. And not just between a teacher and child, but anytime you have a conversation going, there's, there's a serve like you have in the tennis and a bat back. So that serve and, serve and return interaction between two people, uh, particularly for children, will build the brain development. The neurons in their brain are responding and making connections all the time. And even from uh, a newborn baby right through to you know, us, us as adults, we're still building those uh, connections. Of course, in, in children, those connections will be maintained um, as they keep on building uh, those conversations and that knowledge. And how we interact with children, of course, is also very important. Um, we use a very welcoming and gentle manner, positive tone, and always asking open-ended questions because that really tells a child what you're thinking is important to me. And we're also helping because if children have a question, they're trying to find out the answer. So we try to help children to solve those problems together. We're empowering uh, their learning and supporting their learning and thinking all the time. How do we um, maintain these connections? So we're doing lots of uh, hands-on learning experiences where we can build children's social and cognitive competence. Communication, of course, is that key. We're back to that serve and return into action. And children are building confidence all the time. So even something as simple as uh, making Play-Doh or making a cake, they're learning new things, they're reflecting on that, and they're building their own self-confidence. So children, when they come to school, they're in a safe environment they know they have a place in the world and they're familiar with that setting. They know that children and adults are going to support their routines. Um, they're going to help them learn boundaries and learn the limits of what's right and what's not right, that acceptable behavior. So a sense of belonging is therefore supported by honoring a child's individual spirit and their individuality um, and their presence is valued. Um, at our school, we don't particularly uh, insist on having a school uniform. And what's uh, really uh, powerful about that is you see that children can really truly express themselves. This morning, we had two little boys come, their two siblings, they came in dressed in their Batman t-shirts. So there was Batman 1 and Batman 2. Uh, yesterday, we had a sibling who came in with a, a Captain America America t-shirt and his younger sibling, I think he had um, Spider-Man. So those are ways that we can value children's identity and they know that they have their place in the world. So we teach, uh, we treat them as individuals and we recognize that they all have different capabilities and characteristics and they recognize each other for who they are. So when children are in school, they're learning how to negotiate, they're learning how to collaborate, they're learning how to communicate, they're also learning how to care for others. And that's something that uh, we can role model as adults, but children can role model uh, for themselves. And that peer learning is very, very important. So educators are, are helping children to express their feelings, that's very important, recognize other children's feelings, and to promote the positive social skills taking perspectives that, that comes through time, learning empathy, and developing their emotional regulation through turn taking, for example. Move on. And families are also, also a big part of what we do. We want children to be able to um, make those connections in school and take them out into the community. And again, through role modeling, we can build those uh, reciprocal relationships uh, through school with the children and with our family and with our wider community because Parents are the children's first educators and they really know their children uh, best. They have that unique knowledge and they have all the, the context and background. Talking about you know, the wider world, uh, our children, uh, we are, I mean, all schools uh, strive to be inclusive uh, environments and we want to uh, encourage children to form those authentic and caring relationships. And that's very important. 
we're seeing in our classrooms uh, children who are um, very supportive and very caring to new children joining us. And, and that's really very um, joyful to see. Children who have additional needs have the same opportunity and we need to support them in the same rich and fulfilling way so that they eventually figure out their part in the world as well. And wider engagement. Um, we also want to uh, support children figure out that connectedness to the wider community and particularly the natural environment and uh, they're part of a bigger world. Um, in our school we have things like earthworms and mealworms. I had a conversation with my daughter last night about whether I would actually eat any mealworms. So you know those kind of conversations are very important because they, they are forming part of um, you know sustainability uh, and the future. So how do we build some connections uh, with our families and with our children? Ultimately, things like face-to-face -face connection, uh, phone calls, emails, going out into the community, documentation. We use uh, an application called Story Park and we share regular updates with parents uh, about what's happening in school. Of course, social media, and we warmly invite parents to come and visit our schools to, just to see for themselves the type of setting and the philosophy that we have. So during the pandemic, there was the challenge. How did we cultivate relationships uh, during that difficult time? Well, using, as I've mentioned, Story Park, we uh, shared activities daily. We shared what was happening in the classroom. Um, activities uh, were things like yoga poses. We did baking together. We had uh, music and movement activities that children could do at home with their families. And those were shared every day. The other thing that was um, really cool to do was live streaming of activities and that was uh, shared with the world by Bloomberg and um, basically uh, giving uh, families a list of materials that they might need and therefore to uh, a certain time to live stream how to do those activities together, uh, a very authentic way to maintain that connection. We also provided consistency and I think this was very important for particularly young children. Um, initially, a lot of families in Hong Kong did leave Hong Kong, so we had check-ins with them through email, through phone call, through video chat. Uh, we tried to get groups of children together so they could see each other in, on screen, whether that was through Zoom, through WhatsApp chat, or through a Google Meet classroom. And um, the other thing that we did that worked really well, and actually worked best for our community, was to maintain some kind of childcare. So during that time, particularly in February last year, uh, when the world was going crazy, actually what the children needed was some stability and to be in familiar settings. So we provided care and of course socially distance. Um, we also had um, opportunities for our children to come together in the neighbourhood, small groups, um, on an optional basis. So that was one way to maintain that connection between school and, um, and home. Additional provision, which was uh, very welcome um, from our community, we sent home home learning packs. Um, I think there was a, a quite a, a flower shortage uh, in February last year, so we tried not to do too much like Play-Doh stuff, but we also sent home little Play-Doh packs. Uh, one of my personal favorite, favorites was lemon oobleck, which um, was corn flour and a real lemon that went through the mail, so that was quite awesome. We also did some outreach sessions. We have quite a, a large community from different islands of Hong Kong. And we sent a teaching team several times a week to one of those islands to um, have some outdoor play with those children. And the other thing that we uh, extended was a library book borrowing service so that families could drop in, take some books and maintain that uh, story time at home with different books. So those are the things that uh, we did to maintain um, provision. Ultimately, it comes down to how do we build resilience? So these are some um, critical skills that we need children to have in order to build resilience. And it, it's a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens through uh, children coming to school and learning some of these skills. So one very important one, of course, is emotional regulation, the ability to um, regulate your emotions, particularly when you're feeling overwhelmed. The other one that's important to have is impulse control. Um, being able to delay gratification. There's a very famous marshmallow test, which is very interesting. Three, four-year-olds um, have different level of impulse control, but we know from research that um, having the ability to, um, to delay gratification means that children have, uh, are more successful later on in life. There's a lot of research about that. Number three, uh, causal analysis, the ability to decide what will happen if you have this problem and how can you face it. 
a few more. Um, number four, realistic optimism. Uh, I must admit this is one thing that's carried me through uh, COVID, the ability to maintain that um, positive mindset despite the limitations that are there. And, um, you know, we all wish we could go into this uh, plane and, and fly somewhere, but we know that that's just not possible. But we know that it will happen someday. Having empathy, the ability to understand feelings and needs of others, that's something that is um, is really more important now than probably having academic skills, that ability to appreciate how others are feeling is, is, is crucial. Self-efficacy, having your beliefs uh, that you can make a difference and you can succeed, that's also very important. The final one, reaching out, the ability to learn from your mistakes and to take on new opportunities. So these are the critical skills that we need to support, but how can we encourage children to build these skills? One simple answer, let children play, because through play, children can build a very crucial foundation to um, learn new skills, to build relationships with others, and to understand the world around them. When they're in an authentic and safe environment, they can therefore get ready to figure things out in much more detail. Some references. I particularly recommend uh, the reference right on the far right, Centre on the Developing Child by Harvard University. It's very interesting. There's a lot of research there about brain development and how toxic stress uh, impacts on a uh, developing brain. Um, but there, there are lots of videos, so it's uh, definitely a good watch. Um, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Betty, for your sharing. Next up, uh, we're going to pan pass it over to Ray Gern, who will give us a Montessori perspective. So, Ray, over to you. Uh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. And let me just, uh, hopefully you can see this slideshow. Um, are you able to see my slide? Yeah, okay, good. So I, um, I, you know, as Christopher mentioned, I'm going to share the Montessori perspective and um, our particular perspective at Higher Ground. Um, and, you know, to start with, we have just been through a global pandemic and um, and there's a sense in which it's been a totally unprecedented event in our lives. You know, and we're talking about what this unprecedented event has taught us about resilience. But I think really to fully understand the um, lessons we've learned from COVID, uh, we have to step back first and ask whether it is really that unprecedented. Or is it just a dramatic instance of the fact that life presents challenges all the time as the norm and not the acceptance, uh, not the exception? Uh, Maria Montessori said that, quote, no hero was a hero before he performed his heroic deed. The trials life has in store for us are unforeseen and unexpected, and no one can prepare us directly to meet them. It is only through having a vigorous soul that we can be prepared for anything. And if we think about that in relation to COVID, um, I'd argue that the challenge presented by COVID is in certain ways, um, while it's unprecedented, uh, anthropologically normal. You know, in a deeper sense, it's part of the human condition. And you, even you could argue that it's a paradigmatic, paradigmatic feature of the human condition and the human species that we need to face down this total diverse um, set of threats you know, from an indifferent nature, from circumstance, including novel disease. And our tools are what they've always been, foresight, wisdom, science, and the innovative products these make possible. And healthy and well-adjusted people do not spend their lives making lists of the particular adversities we may face, you know, trying one by one to be ready for them. Right? Life's challenges, whether they're personal challenges like a loss of a loved one, or a common and shared challenge like the global pandemic we've been confronted with, um, they can't be predicted in advance. You know, there's only one real way to prepare ourselves um, to make sure that we have the capacities needed to act in those situations. 
And that really comes down to the core person we are, our values, our habits, you know, our inner compass. And um, the same point actually holds with respect to the opportunities that life presents. They too are not predictable. They have to be seized through deci uh, decisive, thoughtful action. Um, and this is especially true today. Uh, I have a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and a one-year-old, three boys. And I think a lot about the future that is in store for them. Um, the most important aspect of that future is that we know there's going to be massive change and we can't predict what specifically it is going to be. From AI to cryptocurrencies, economics, politics, um, geographical shifts and cultural ones, the things not even imagined, right? We know that the world is changing and yet we can't even begin to guess how it will evolve. You know, I think that my children, even though they live in the United States, won't be driving uh, cars, um, very likely. Um, will they have some kind of contact lens that they wear that labels the world for them, right? This is not science fiction, right? Universal translators. Um, where will they live? Will they move back to Canada, you know, where I grew up, uh, I'm a newborn? Um, where are your children um, stay here where you are in Hong Kong? Or will they move to Shanghai or to Toronto? Um, or perhaps you know, to some entrepreneurial, you know, mega city in Africa that is yet unborn. Our job as parents is to help our children future-proof themselves. And this means the capacity to, to adapt, to self-regulate, to apply thought to new situations. Um, this is not unique to COVID. I think COVID has just writ large showed us and made dramatically clear what education needs to do and needs to be. I mean, we think of this as resilience, as persistence, as a strength arising from grit or from inner discipline. Um, it is these things, but uh, what's radical about Montessori in, in, is her view of where these things come from. Her view is that resilience is um, a consequence of the cap capacity to engage in chosen self-directed, constant, deeply concentrated activity and what that makes possible. It comes from a sense, a deep sense that one is capable of acting successfully in the world. A child that develops this type of can-do attitude, it's a view that the world is open to her thought and her effort and that she is capable of solving problems, you know, will develop the inner strength to act when life requires it. Um, to put it differently, I'd argue that resilience is not, it's not fundamentally an expression of grit. I think we can mistakenly think of it that way. It's an expression of entrepreneurialism. Adaptability is rooted in one's ability to think and to act you know, independently in the, in the teeth of circumstance. And you know, when you think of actual problem solving and creative thinking, you know, think about how messy it is. And we just have, a, I just have a little diagram here. It's not neat and orderly in the way that you would study a chapter from a textbook, prepare for an exam and take the exam. Real thinking is messy. It's not cut and dry. And what we need in education is an approach designed to develop the capacity to think this way, to develop executive functioning and cognitive activity and the ability to engage in self-guided concentration, you know, grounded, as I said, in a deep sense of one's own ability to learn and to grow and to you know, improve one's world. Helping children develop the cognitive tools to deal with the unknown and the confidence to know that they can do so successfully, in the case of Montessori, is embedded into the system itself. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Montessori. Um, I'll just say, you know, 100 years ago, Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, and you know, in some ways, the symbol of entrepreneurialism, um, he was really the first famous American champion of Montessori education. Uh, in Edison's view, um, you know, Montessori respected that orientation towards the world, you know, that, um, that problem solving approach. You know, and if you look forward 100 years later, Edison um, has been proven correct. And there's countless Western innovators, entrepreneurs, and industrialists. And I think that's true, true across the world, um, as well as actors and athletes that develop their nascent potential in Montessori environments. Right? You, you know many of the most famous, um, I have some of them up here. Mark Andreessen, 
who um, leads Indris and Horowitz, considered the most forward-thinking venture fund in 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 the world um, by many. Um, in 2015, was asked like, "What can America do to to create more entrepreneurs and more of an entrepreneurial spirit?" And he gave a list of 15 recommendations. And at the top was to create more Montessori or kind of Montessori-like Montessori-inspired uh, schools. And I would put you know, Reggio in some ways in the same tradition, these developmental approaches. So what is it about Montessori? Um, and I think, I think you know, the, the, the um, I, won't, I won't spend too much time on this and we can discuss it further if you have questions in the Q&A, but the, the thing to understand is that when the Prussian model emerged out of Germany in the 1850s, a false alternative was embedded into education that you could either focus on autonomy, self-directed learning, you know, and, and holistic learning, um, or you could focus on content and skills, or you could focus on knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge. And they would, they, you know, or you could trade them off against each other. And I think what, what, what Montessori showed is that you have to have 100% of both. And it's not just a blending of the two, it's an entirely different approach, a discovery learning self-directed approach that respects the internal architecture of content and skill development. You cannot understand genetics if you don't understand evolution, not a science. You can't understand evolution if you don't understand heredity. And yet, what if a child is interested in genetics? How, how do you grapple with that issue? How do you impart a definite set of content and skills while respecting the fact that you can't connect the dots. You literally can't connect the dots in a child's mind. And this, you know, this is what Montessori solves. And I think what it adds up to is um, we see these three features of any great program. And if you ever want to obsess any school and say, is it creating the type of environment that will help my child become this capable adult? Does it have a love of work, a love of concentrated activity? Do you see children in deep states of joyous concentration? Is there a love of knowledge, a desire to know, a desire to get to the bottom of things, to understand, um, cultivated, and then a love of humanity, you know, a love of human achievement, you know? Um, um, I, I'm gonna very quickly read this quote because I find it so powerful and I think it sums up, you know, what I think uh, from Montessori. Um, the inert child who never worked with his hands, who never had the feeling of being useful and capable of effort, who never found by experience that to live means living socially and to, that to think and create means to make use of a harmony of souls. This type of child will become a selfish youth. He will become pessimistic and will seek on the surface of vanity the compensation for a lost paradise. And thus a lessened man, he will appear at the gates of the university and to ask for what? to ask for a profession that will render him capable of making his home in a society in which he is a stranger and which is indifferent to him. He will enter into society in order to take part in the functioning of a civilization for which he lacks all feeling. Um, we think a lot in these programs about developing a certain type of soul, a certain type of capacity. Um, it is, that is of a piece with developing the ability to get a job and the ability to do great meaningful work. That there's an integration between mind and body, between existential material success and inner serenity. And it, it, you know, again, it is both or neither in our view. Um, and you know, this is really in our in our kind of sense, perspective, the essence of entrepreneurialism. You know, at root, it's about problem solving, looking at facts, seeing them for what they are, collaborating with others, you know, without lying to oneself, um, and working to re reshape the world. And um, that deep ability to figure things out is formed very early. You know, it is not innate. It is just formed very early. Uh, I will, in the interest of time, just move to um, making one last point, which is, again, to reiterate that what COVID has shown us is not an exception. It's an example writ large of what has always been true, that resilience is an expression of the capacity for creativity and thought and action. And it's made possible for, by a deep kind of inner confidence based in reality that one is capable and one is worthy of living well. Montessori is not a factory. It does not create entre entrepreneurs in the same way. It doesn't create any other human value, a strong work ethic or inner serenity, goodwill, good grades. What Montessori offers is an environment in which children can create their own best selves. And as a consequence, both achieve the potential, their own potential as efficacious 
you know, as knowledgeable, as conscientious, self-directed beings. Um, and as a consequence, offer the wonders of their creativity and energy to the world, um, allowing us, I think, to, to weather the next challenge and to seize the next opportunity, whatever it may be. Um, so thanks, I'll stop there and look forward to hearing more from you. Let's turn off my screen. Thanks a lot, Ray, for sharing that very uh, intellectual presentation. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, we are now going to hand it over to Dr. Emilia Lee, who will give us in her insights from the School of Continuing Education at Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, Dr. Lee, over to you. Thank you. Um, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, and uh, I've already shared the screen. So uh, today's uh, topic is on building res resilience in early child education. So I will firstly, uh, define resilience because uh, Betty and Ray have already touched uh, a bit about the quality of resilience. So uh, I will make use of OECD uh, uh, definition and then uh, I will later on talk on about how to build resilience uh, as a parent or uh, education practitioners. And then uh, what is the impact uh, of COVID on uh, early child education? Okay, and then uh, so uh, this is um, from OECD because resilience is not only important for an individual, it is very important for an economy as well. Uh, COVID actually hit uh, the world uh, uh, subtly and uh, there are lots of um, setback. Uh, so resilience actually is not just overcoming. So uh, we can bounce back stronger and learn after the crisis. So the important point is that we not just overcome. So that is uh, not only recover from uh, any adverse shock, but bounce back and make stronger. So this is the point why we talk uh, so much on resilience and we pay much attention on this uh, grooming, this kind of uh, attributes, okay? And then uh, the second one is also from OECD, uh, that is for an individual capacity. So resilience uh, is the individual capacity to overcome adverse circumstances, okay? So we are able to overcome, adapt, and engage, same as what Ray mentioned before. So I just consolidate the concept into uh, by this definition. So uh, we are able to adapt to change and then trust actively engage with our digital world. So uh, Ray mentioned that, uh, how about the futures? Uh, how, how, how will uh, the children be uh, in uh, uh, 15 years uh, later? Actually, digital world is the future. However, we need to manage that kind of progress very well. So uh, and it's not just about fiction. So there is nobody to drive a car, but we can go there. And uh, Mega City, as uh, Ray mentioned, it is, it is not a, just a dream, a fiction. That will come true and uh, how we prepare our younger generation is very important. So uh, resilience, uh, that is a research from uh, uh, UCL, uh, UK, uh, University of California, uh, uh, University of College London, uh, that is uh, Institute of Education. So uh, resilience is the ability so to summer strength when uh, summer strength when needed and able to beat the odds of adversity. It is very important even though if you are in a not a very favorable uh, situation or condition, you are still able to win. So that is beat the odds. So um, the world paying much attention to the uh, less developed countries or those countries not so favorable to make sure that uh, the people, the young, the children there can, can grow heavily and able to win. So um, uh, what is resilient? Why are they so important? as mentioned by uh, Betty before about um, the, the school, the quality. So that is a personal trait. It is very important to lead us to success. And also this is a lifelong skills to cope with change and uncertainty. Same as Ray mentioned, that is uh, on the Montessori approach. And then uh, the world change rapidly. So this is a coping skills. We have to, to ensure that our younger generation have it. And uh, there are many research support that that will lead to academic achievement and career success that can bring us for the lifelong and uh, building good relationships because we have may, may have some um, uh, uh, unhappy relationships. We are able to uh, have what reconciliations 
and then uh, sustain that relationship is very important. And then uh, maintaining good mental and physical health. That is important because there are lots of uh, mental issues and obesity discipline that is related to resilience as well. And uh, the most important is a crucial role in social emotional well-being. Okay, social emotional skills is a very uh, important topic in OECD in the past five years that prove a lot of positive impact to the individual and the society, as well as the education as well. So what are the implications for education policy? Because we are educators and we are parents, we should know what are the uh, implications of the education policy. So this is uh, from our, uh, our publications from uh, UCL as well. That is ability and traits, including resilience and grit. That help you and uh, uh, to and help you and people to persevere with setback and competently engage in uh, debates and contribute to the wider community as equally important to young people as securing a good grade. So we should not ignore resilience or social emotional skill. So they should go pair with academic development as well. So uh, this is the very important component we have to so this is uh, a research from UCL, okay? So they try to break down the core uh, skills, social skills uh, for a different domain. You see they break down into self-perception, self-awareness, and then second category is motivation, self-control and self-regulations. This become a very important component in the Hong Kong curriculum guide as well, and social skills, and they put down resilience and coping. Okay, and then emotional health. You see that they bring a long, uh, uh, a long-term benefit to adult mental health and well-being, labor market, success in career, social economic status, and then physical health and health behavior, and then other domain. So you see, resilience brings mental health and well-being, labor market and social economic. But other components are also important. Actually, they are interrelated. So uh, I want to make uh, a bigger picture. So actually resilience is a skills of social, uh, a type of social and emotional skills. Okay, so uh, this is uh, social emotional skills is a, last, a skill lasting through life. So there are longitudinal research. So there is evidence base. So uh, that is leading to positive adult outcome and then positive mental health. Uh, recently, especially uh, we are in the uh, city jungle, mental health is an issue. So you know, wonder find that in Japan uh, and in Hong Kong, the uh, uh, suicidal rate is very high, especially at the teenage. So maintaining positive mental health is very important. And then it also leads to interpersonal relationship, academic attainment, civic engagement, uh, productive employment, they have to enter the workforce and then some physical health and later life, okay? So uh, this is um, uh, the research of a Pennsylvania State U. So this is the very, uh, very um, uh, summarized the importance of uh, social emotional skills. So um, maybe I go deep into Hong Kong situation because most of the participants are from Hong Kong. So uh, I, I make reference to a, a publication from uh, OECD in 2018. Uh, the publication based on the survey of PISA in 2015. Everyone know that this is a benchmark uh, uh, score uh, 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 applied to other countries to uh, give some indicator or indications about the development of a country, but they pay uh, much attention on education because education is an important part to, uh, to build human capital. That is uh, very important. So according to this table, you find that Hong Kong is here. Uh, don't think that because the highest score is the bottom, is the bottom. So uh, for the academic resilience, we rank third in the world. So very good results. However, on the other hand, about social and emotional resilience, that kind of domain, Hong Kong ranked almost the lowest, okay? So you see there is a great contradictions between social emotional resilience and also academic resilience. 
you find that actually those young people, they don't have life satisfaction. So uh, we read from the newspaper, that's finding also appeared in Hong Kong newspaper um, a few years ago. But this is our duty as an educator, how to, or, or parents, how to, um, how to improve the condition. So in order to make our younger generation more happier and fit for work, that is our duty. Okay, so um, the importance uh, is to build social emotional skills. So uh, making reference to um, uh, Betty's mention, uh, the ecological sy system. So we, everyone, families, schools, and communities play an important role, okay? That is very important. So we need to collaborate together. So there is a saying that we need, uh, actually, uh, we need a village to raise a child. It is very true. We need a village. So every one of us has to collaborate. So parental engagement is important. Same as Betty mentioned, attachment. So attachment with teachers, with parents, that is to strengthen our social emotional skills. And then uh, it is especially important in the early stage of development. Okay, school can foster social and emotional skills by strengthening interactions between teachers and mentors. So the relationship with teachers is very important. Even for the teenagers, they, they, uh, they mention so much about the relationship with teachers. So if they love a teacher, they usually perform that particular subject better. So relationship is very important. So, um, so that we hope to bring in real life examples. So kindergarten, we bring in many real life examples and uh, in the curricular and extra curricular uh, activities as well. It is very important. So uh, uh, we are not segregate. Uh, so family, school and community should uh, work hand in hand. So they can cross fertilize as well. Okay, and then at different age, a stage of uh, uh, a child's development. We need to input different stages of in, uh, experience of individual life. So we need to change according to the developmental stages. And then uh, the current level of skills determines the extent to which individual can benefit from the new learning and investment. Actually, what they gain here can benefit their future learning experience that build up their confidence as well. So uh, this is um, a research from Hong Kong that is from a think tank uh, that done a very recent uh, publication only released in 2020. The research was done in uh, 2019 that is about Hong Kong situation that is put into the context. So individual factors is about uh, the teenagers, they need to have the problem solving skills, coping skills, and then they have self-esteem, self-efficacy, same as um, Becky mentioned. Uh, internal locus of control, autonomy and independence, empathy, sense of purpose and meaning for life. That is important. They can become self-directed, plan for their life, and then sense of humor. That means they enjoy their life. We need to groom as well. So the family, what can family do? Support, trust, and, and love from the family. Same as I mentioned, parenting practices, especially healthy communications, pattern. Okay, need to keep the dialogue with the kids what they have done, what are the uh, frustration they have, what uh, share their success. Okay, actually social economic status of the family is also important. It depends, it will affect the resources you put on that child. And uh, it is very typical in Chinese family. Uh, this is, but that is quite alarming to me as well. I think at least one parent who sets expectation on child, okay, set goal for the children to achieve and then can act as a source of support and mentor, not just setting unreachable target, but as a source of support, providing coaching, achieve the target you set on that, okay? And then the school, same, uh, engagement and sense of belonging, network with friends, so we need to build a harmonious atmosphere in the school, among the parents as well, okay? An inclusive and uh, accommodative school, and a so good model, teachers should be a good model. And then also have at least an adult set expectations on child, okay? For the community, I skip it uh, so you can read from the uh, article. So um, my point is that for parents, okay? Foot for thought, what can you do at home to help your child 
to build resilience. It's very important because uh, in Chinese culture, we focus more on academic achievement, but we omit some other development. Nowadays, the skills because of the changing environment, uh, rapid changing um, situation ahead, we need to build a broader set of skills for our young children in order to make sure they are able to survive and even succeed in the future. Okay, so how do we implement that? Okay, so because we are focusing on early child education, I will talk a bit. And for the teachers, how can you help your students to strengthen resilience? Okay, so what is the most important point that you take away from this section? Free speaker. So I, I maybe uh, Chris can uh, uh, follow up on this. So tips for parents and caregivers. Okay, quality time is very important. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, we see some challenges because uh, for working parents, we have long working hours. We need to spare, be disciplined, make sure we have quality time with our kids, bedtime story, reading together, okay? And have some quality time for uh, um, um, hiking or uh, a country park or any area to pray, to build relationship and also giving exposure, widen their horizon. Okay, and then uh, building strong parent-child bond like talking about feeling. It is not common for us to go deep. Oh, are you happy? Do you enjoy the process of the work? So we usually focus on the outcome. Do you enjoy the process? How is your relationship with your classmate, with your teachers? How do you feel today? Is it a, a happy day or a sad day? When you, um, when you win a ball game, Okay, of course we cheer. How about we lose a game? How to overcome it? Okay, talking about feeling, uh, feelings is very important. So uh, we omit teaching self-care and maintaining daily routine, including sufficient sleep. That, that may be very strange for, um, for those not in Hong Kong. Actually, uh, we don't focus on self-care because we rely on helper. And then uh, we don't focus on daily routine. So um, even the kids, um, in the, they, are, they do not have sufficient sleep. So when they wake up in the morning at 10 school, they usually look so tired in the first hour, okay? Because the parents work late and then they go, uh, they go to bed late as well. But sufficient sleep according to real science is very important. They need to process what they learn in the daytime. So uh, we encourage kids to go to bed at 9 p.m., not later at that time, according to pediatrics, okay, our recent research. Okay, setting high, but achievable expect expectation. So step by step, okay? Cannot ask the student to get a uh, full mark if uh, the child just attained only 50 marks, okay? Just maybe five marks higher and then encourage them to achieve a little bit higher if they fail, don't punish, okay? Giving time to kids for working things out by themselves, okay? Allowing time to explore and then building self-esteem, okay? It is specifically important when kids facing failure. Maybe we have um, uh, conflicts with our classmates, how, uh, some disappointments, may not get what they want. Uh, and also we need to engage in extracurricular activities and then practicing self-reflection. It's very important because through the reflections, we can claim what are the success elements. And on the other hand, we can improve and then take another attempt, okay? For the teachers, enhancing the curriculum, saying that's a uh, two uh, Montessori approach and major approach, uh, then breaking down the task into small steps, achievable. And then the teachers is very important, a role model to help raise children's self-esteem and motivation. It is very important. Uh, we build up a very good atmosphere at school, building positive relationship with children and their families. So don't ignore, not just children, family, school with families and then families with between families, okay? Maintaining harmonious, positive and trusting relationship between family teachers and peers, promoting inclusion, and celebrating diversity. Okay, in COVID, these are the statistics from uh, OECD. 
Okay, 94% of the school have been affected. And then uh, 40 million children, okay, miss out on early education. And then uh, in a disruption to school, no schooling, no face to face. So um, those schools uh, like uh, that is one, uh, they, they use some kind of means to, uh, to break through the barriers. So uh, hindering the holistic support to children's uh, uh, well-being, dropout rate, and then in adequate space for children to play, uh, we change to online learning, digitalization. Actually, through that kind of change, the importance of parents' importance is rising. Okay, so there is a rising of okay. I don't. I skip this, and then we need to identify the gap. Okay, the gap. Some teachers usually do not have the skills to facilitate online learning because during the teacher's training, we don't address on it. And then parents are lack of time and digital skills to support children's learning at home. So those who are from um, a better SES background, family background, the parents are more able to master. So there is a good divide between the society, the uh, high SES and the low SES. So the children's ability is also a great divide as well. So there is a digital divide. Some families are led of access to even no internet, uh, resources necessary for children's learning online, and disparity in readiness to change. So stress on underprivileged family and children. So how can we narrow the gap, okay? For giving um, skills required for success in online learning, so that is the strong attitudes towards learning, self-regulation, intrinsic motivation to learn. These are all about social emotional skills. So that is the key to address the gap in the COVID, okay? So however, we also have to pay note that these skills are also required for face-to-face -face learning, not just, just on the uh, online learning. Okay, so the conditions, to groom this disposition and attitude. Emotional support, repeat again, cultivating positive and optimistic attitude. Okay, so um, the, the uh, self-esteem, promoting self-esteem, exposing to these skills in the early year through role models from the adults, from the parents, from the teachers. So these are the reference uh, I make, uh, sorry, I, okay. Okay, these are the reference. And then I uh, thank you for all. So I hope the COVID, uh, the pandemic uh, will be uh, uh, getting away from us very soon. So fight for the COVID and uh, have a good day. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Thanks so much, Dr. Lee. Um, so yeah. unfortunately we are coming to the end of our session and we had wanted to set aside some time um, for a bit of Q and A. And we did get, we do have a question from a parent. So, uh, uh, I want to make sure that we get to this one first. And so, so for everyone else, please excuse us if we do overrun by a minute or two. Um, so from Alex uh, to the panelists, as parents to support our children to develop new skills, at what point um, will the child feel too much pressure? So his, his, his child is quite shy. What's a fine line to provide support and give him time to get, to, to get him to get used to his environment? And at what point can he encourage uh, he can, can he encourage his child to take the next step, an extra step? So, uh, Betty, would it be all right if I pass this over to you? Uh, yeah, no problem. Yes, uh, it's a, a really appropriate question, and we're seeing, um, you know, children haven't had they've missed out on a lot of social in, interaction and opportunities to be in authentic um, in, in their settings where they can really role play and they can see, um, you know, social uh, situations unravel. So. I think the key there is really to give uh, your child some time because eventually when they go to uh, their school setting, if you've got the environment where they're comfortable and they're happy, it will just take that, it just take your child a little bit of time to open up. And I think, um, again, the relationship with the school, make sure that your, your, the school know that he's a little bit shy and, you know, we'll try and make accommodations to make that transition very easy. Um, things that we can do ahead of time in summer school is very popular this year is to maybe spend a bit of time accompanied in maybe some, uh, obviously don't know the age of child, I'm assuming uh, maybe play group, um, doing some play groups which are accompanied and then gradually uh, building up confidence in that setting so the child is able to 
uh, then feel comfortable and, and to go it alone. So I think really just um, judging, engaging um, how you can support your child and not, not, not again, as an expectation. He's, he's a shy child. Um, he's, he'll overcome that when, in his own time when he builds up his own confidence. It's about having that sense of love and belonging. Um, he'll then move up to the other um, building confidence later on. So um, finding the right setting for your child where he's going to be happy, that will come. Don't, don't worry too much. And, and again, where, where you, you push the boundary, it, it, again, having that quality relationship with your child through reading stories together, you can see different social situations from books where your child can reflect on those and, and eventually he'll get there. So, you know, just find the right setting to support him and work with the school and, you know, try not to worry too much. He'll, he'll get there. Maybe I can add one more point. Sometimes the kids uh, actually, uh, they don't want to separate with parents. So the school uh, actually is very warm and receiving. So um, you may need to address uh, separation. So in the storybook, you may mention that, oh, uh, when a kid goes up, they have to uh, do their, something by their own. So you can uh, prepare the kids by some story. So through the storytelling, uh, we have some different character. Then they will learn that, oh, some situations, they will be away, but guarantee them that the parents will come back. Okay, so uh, accompany them for a longer time, so they will gradually adapt it to the school environment. Don't worry at that about about that too much. Yeah. Great. Um, I have another question. Um, it's around the Montessori philosophy, so I'm going to obviously field this one, uh, direct this one to Ray. This is from Cecilia. Um, she would like to know uh, under the Montessori philosophy, can technology and online learning integrate into child learning? Yeah, I mean, our view is absolutely. And, and you know, we have a concept that we call tethered digital. Um, so up, up until about nine years old, anyone that's on a virtual or dis digital program, we're sending physical materials to very tactile learning to, to people's homes. And so, you know, actually it's, it's, it's digitally enabled offline learning. And so as young as a three-year-old, you watch a 20 minute video and talk to your guide about how to peel tangerines and then we explain, here's how you set up the table, here's which bowls you should buy, so that the physical materials are the right one. Um, he, you know, we can even kind of help set up environments. So, so it's kind of like a, you know, it's like a yes and no, like, yes, absolutely, you know, we can use digital technology, but we have to be creative and there is a need for physical tangible materials at the younger ages. Um, and, and then more broadly, I'd say like, you know, generally the question of technology of like, is it good or bad? I always say, wrong question, it is here. It is undebatable that your children are gonna be massively impacted. It's like asking, is it good or bad to have a swimming pool in your home? And the reality is, well, can your kids swim, right? Because if they can't swim, it's a lot more dangerous than if they can. And you can, put a, you can put a fence around that swimming pool and you can tell your kids not get into that pool. But if you know they're gonna get in that pool, you have an obligation and a responsibility to, to, to help them learn how to swim. And, and there's a way in which they are going to be part of a world that is, they're surrounded by technology and technology in many ways is just choice. It's unlimited choice, literally at your fingertips and the role of the education system and, and as a parent is to develop the capacity to handle that much choice, which is, which is why like you have to do it when the stakes are small, you know, you have to allow the, the, this development of concentrated activity and this, this ability to, you know, self-regulate and self-manage because, um, other people are not going to do it for you anymore. And I even I'll just make one last point. You know, time management for for the professional for the executive used to be like your your differentiation. Today, it's just permission to play. Like the thing that you have to do as an adult is manage your own energy. When do you need a break? When do you need to cancel your weekend plans and get your work done? When do you need to go talk to that friend who's going to give you you know a kick in the butt? When you do you need to you know indulge your own you know um, emotions a little bit? Like these are skills that again there is no more divide between academic and non-academic. It's all one totality, you know, that you're bringing to bear on the living of life. Great, thank you very much for that, Ray. Um, okay, we're gonna stick around for a few more minutes. So um, if anyone else has, has any questions, by all means, uh, let us know. In the meantime, I do have a question for our panelists. Um, uh, can you give us kind of your top key learning points around early childhood 
education development that you have taken away as a result of this pandemic? Um, Betty, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask uh, you first. Question. Um, I mean, this could be a positive or negative. Uh, <laughs> My, my perspective, um, what the key learning point really has, despite everything happening in the world, I think what we need, what we need to bring back to is um, be flexible and for children to maintain consistency. Because really, when your whole world is turned upside down, what you just need is some aspect of um, maintaining something that's familiar. And you know, um, cabin fever has been you know a big thing, and the lack of social engagement that, that children have had to face. So for me, um, education became care rather than education. And I think that, that's an important distinction because we're, we're, we're not just educators, we're providing care and nurturing children. So the biggest takeaway for me was really to, to work with our community and to find a formula that worked best for our community because you know, government policies and, and, and guidelines were much slower than us to respond. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a journey, but um, yeah, we've, we've learned from it. Uh, Dr. Lee, how about you? Thank you. So uh, from the COVID, actually, um, every one of us, same as Becky said, uh, we need to be flexible and uh, willing to take the challenges. And uh, throughout the past one and a half year, I'm, I'm still feel very grateful and impressed by all the frontline practitioners. They are so creative to find the solutions and help the parents. So actually their passions in education help the field to grow. So this is my very, I have a very strong feeling and I, I really appreciate uh, the collaborative efforts we have done. And uh, also there are lots of um, uh, innovation happen. So uh, I appreciate it. And I I'm, I'm feel very um, uh, confident that we set a very good model for our children so they are able to uh, sustain that kind of uh, SES skills in the future. And uh, uh, from my uh, observation, so um, our life, uh, even though being disrupted, but there's still some key elements were going on, maybe uh, the office mode, but for the kindergarten, we still maintain uh, personal interaction. So online learning is uh, put on our uh, list priority, unless there's another, maybe a, a, a school suspension that is an alternative way. We treasure the people interaction, the families, the children with children, that is important. We don't want to omit any uh, uh, key development stages uh, through uh, from a zero newborn to eight years old. People interaction is very important. And finally, uh, Ray. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what the other panelists have said completely. Um, so just, you know, I would probably have said the same thing. So just to take a different angle. Um, it's very apparent to me that we are at the beginning of a couple of decades of radical transformative change in education. And the reality is if you go and pick anything from 2021 and you read, you know, the most forward thinking avant-garde uh, essays on education, you could go back to 1921, modernize the language 100 years ago, it's the same. The issues are the same, the, you know, very little has changed. We've been frozen for, for almost 100 years. Um, and, and I think the combination of just, you know, parental knowledge, you know, cognitive science and development psychology, um, um, whole so all sorts of tailwinds from technology and then, and then, you know, now with COVID, where an entire generation of parents have been awoken to the fact that you know, something is something is off here, and I can't, I got to spend more time thinking about my kid's school than I do picking, you know, which which uh, car car to buy. Um, uh, we are in for an exciting. It's going to be an exciting future to be a parent and to be an educator. Um, you know, I think it's, it, I think it's unimaginable. You know what's coming. Now, unfortunately, we are quite overrun, so uh, that does conclude our webinar for today. We do have other questions that have come in, um, and if you do have any kind of burning thoughts, feedback, or reactions, please do forward them to us at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and we will make sure that the questions get addressed by our panelists. So thank you once again to our amazing panelists for their knowledge and expertise uh, that they brought to today's conversation. 
uh, there's been a lot of insight, um, a lot of rigor to uh, what's been said, and it's been a real pleasure to have moderated this session. Um, I would like to also thank all the uh, participants here for your attention and support. Um, as full-time working parents, knowing that early childhood education um, uh, and well, educators are incorporating resilience building into their curricula and uh, uh, practical teaching goes a long way when it comes to supporting our kids. So if you would like to connect with myself or any of our speakers, please feel free to connect uh, via LinkedIn. And thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you at our next Kenchan event. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye again. Bye. Take care.